I, I remember when we were serving at our previous church, I said to the media people, hey, the, the words up on the screen are fuzzy. Would you make sure you focus that projector? And they did. And then I came back and I said, it's still fuzzy. You need to, you need to, need to focus that. And they said, we did focus it. And I said, well, then maybe we need a new projector or something. Well, it turns out I needed new eyes. I didn't know I needed glasses. It was my eyes that were fuzzy, not the, not the projector, not the words up on the screen. And spiritually speaking, Jesus warned that your eyes can get you into a lot of trouble. Your eyesight is very important. Physically, it's important, but also spiritually, it's important. We're going to talk a little bit more about that today. We've been in a series based on Hebrews 11, the, uh, the book of the Bible called Hebrews chapter 11. If you want to turn there, we'll be looking at verse 32 in just a moment. But we, we're, we've been looking at different heroes of the faith. Not all of the heroes of the faith, but just kind of a long list of them. And we're, we're learning from their experiences. Sometimes they did it right. Sometimes they did not do it right, uh, but they all exhibited courageous faith, and we can learn from that. We can be inspired by that. We can be instructed by that, and we're getting towards the end of the list. There are a few more coming, uh, but towards the end, in, in Hebrews eleven thirty two, 32, it says this, how much more do I need to say? He's been talking about Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Gideon, like we talked about last week. He said, how much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, and he goes on with a, another long list. But I love that he threw this in there. Their weakness was turned to strength. Wow. Their weakness was turned to strength. What a cool thing yeah. to be able to say that God turned your weakness into strength. And we're going to look at specifically today, this is so fitting, for Samson. Samson is one of the guys in the list that we just read there. He is in this hall of faith heroes. And Samson is most famous for, for really a couple things. His, his incredible strength. He is known for being the strongest man ever. And he's also known for his long, luxurious hair. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of interesting as, you know, it was, Samson lived a long time ago, and so today when we imagine him, when artists draw Samson, uh, a few years ago there was a movie on the big screen in theaters about Samson, he's always imagined as this huge brute strength kind of a guy, super, super strong. And he's also imagined as a guy maybe that's not too bright upstairs. So big muscles, not necessarily big brains. But is it possible that Samson actually was built a little bit more like me? Trim, svelte, lean, and mean, but not so much huge and ripped? Is it possible that Samson, the secret of Samson's strength was not his hair, but it was something else? And if so, what was his secret? We're going to look at that today. Samson's story is very relevant to us today. And really, all the Bible stories are. There's something we can learn from all of them. But Samson's story, oh my goodness, we, we can, we can ab immediately apply the lessons from his life starting today. He is such a bigger-than-life guy. There's something you could learn from his life that would save your life and maybe even affect your eternal destiny. It's like it's that big. So I hope you will lean in. Hope you will take notes. Hope you will listen up. I hope you will engage with God's word today. And his, the, the bulk of his story is in Judges chapter 13 to 16. So if you want to turn there, you can read the parts I'm going to skip over because there won't be time for everything. Judges chapter 13 to 16. And it's during the time of Israel's history. Why do we always talk about Israel's history? Because Israel was the chosen people of God. And so God, we see how God specifically worked through them and in their lives. And we learn from that. And we, it helps us to follow God ourselves. And this time period was a time period after they got in the promised land, but before they had a king. Okay, And it was called the period of the judges. And the judges were just simply either national or regional leaders that God raised up to to fight back the enemies that had come against Israel. 
in Judges chapter 13, verse 1, it says something that it says over and over and over again in the book of Judges. That once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord blessed them abundantly for that. Is that what it says? Is that what it says in your Bible? No. My Bible tells me, so the Lord handed them over, in this case, to the Philistines who oppressed them. And over and over again, we see this cycle through the book of Judges. Gideon was one of the judges. We talked about him last week. We see the cycle. Israel does evil. And they do it for years, for decades. They turn away from God. They, and they were, there were two big things that they did over and over that God said, do not do. Once you get to the promised land, whatever you do, don't do this. Number one, don't worship the false gods that you're going to find in the land. And it applied to men and women, but specifically guys, don't intermarry with the people of the land because what they will do is they will turn you to worshiping other gods. So really, it was all about one thing. It was about worshiping other gods. But God said, do not marry the, the non-Israelite people in the land. It is going to trip you up. And besides, God said, I'm bringing my judgment on them. I'm taking their land from them for their sin, and I'm giving it to you. This is the time of the judges. And during this time, the Bible says, the angel of the Lord appeared. Okay, who's the angel of the Lord? When it says the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it's Jesus. Jesus has come. It's, it's not, it's, he hasn't been to Bethlehem yet. It's not, it's before Christmas, but Jesus came and he took on flesh and bones, uh, it would appear, or he took on at least a human form, a visible form, and came and, and he appeared to an Israelite woman. We don't know her name. We know her husband's name was Manoah. She was infertile. She was not able to have children, and she had been crying out to God for a child. And the, and the angel of the Lord came to her, and he gave her a commitment, a command, and a calling. In Judges 13, 5, it says, you will give birth to a son. Woo, hallelujah. That's what they've been praying for. This is awesome, great. And so the angel of the Lord comes and says, you will have a son. That was very, very good news in many, many ways, in the emotional realm, in the farming realm, just in every realm. That was very good news for them. And he said, then he gave a command. And this son that you will have, his hair must never be cut. For he will be dedicated to God. Someone say dedicated to God. Dedicated he will be God. dedicated to God as a Nazirite. We, we usually just kind of say Nazirite. But it, it was a, a, as a Nazirite, a, a Nazirite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. So the Philistines, this hostile, warring nation that was in the promised land, had been just coming against Israel, bam, bam, over and over again, oppressing them. And God said, this son you're, that the Lord is going to give you is going to begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Wow. So this is amazing. There's one word in there that we just don't use today. And so I, I want to just explain just a little bit what it means, a, a, a Nazirite vow. What it means is, in the law of Moses, he talked about this. And Moses said, hey, if you want to really dedicate yourself to God, take a Nazarite vow. It means to voluntarily dedicate yourself to God, consecrate yourself to God, to devote yourself to God, and to separate yourself from a small list of things for a time period. So this was something an adult would do voluntarily to say, God, I want to be more devoted to you. I'm going to take a vow. In the New Testament, we see Paul apparently took a Nazarite vow. I, I believe it's Acts 18. And he also paid for some other people to, uh, for the expenses of their vow because there was, it was quite a bit. There were costly um, sacrifices involved and all kinds of stuff. And so this was a vow that you would take to, co to consecrate yourself to God. To say, God, I'm yours. So what's different about this? We had never seen in, in, the, in the Bible uh, record, we've never seen before someone be a Nazarite from birth. So his parents, well, we, we, can, we can tell they're godly parents, God-fearing parents. They were like, what? From birth? That never happens. It would be sort of like saying he's going to be fasting and praying from birth for all his life. Like, oh, wow, that, that would catch your attention. Well, the child that was born to them was Samson. 
all right? And Samson did a lot of good in his lifetime. He had gutsy, courageous faith. He was, wow. He, he was specifically anointed to deliver Israel from the Philistines. And he stayed in that lane. He didn't just go find any, any neighboring country and just start picking on them or, or whatever. But he, he specifically walked in his anointing to deliver Israel from the Philistines. They were a godless nation of people. And God said, their time in the land is up. And so God did many great miracles through Samson, really amazing stuff, even some weird stuff that God did through him to be able to, to begin to push back the oppression of the Philistines. One of the weirdest to me is that he caught 300 foxes. Now, I don't know how, how you catch them. I don't know. There's sort of a, a varmint that can, can hurt vineyards, so perhaps there was like some, I don't know, some traps or some baiters. I, I don't know, but somehow the Bible says he, he caught 300 foxes. Okay, that already is pretty cool. But then he tied their tails together in pairs and tied a lit torch to them, to those tails, and said, yeah, yeah, and they just went through the grain fields of the Philistines at harvest time. They burned up the grain fields, the vineyards, and the olive groves. So all of a sudden, in that one miraculous act, he began to break the knees of the Philistines. And he was bringing God's judgment against them. How is that possible? Because of God. I, I don't know how else you could explain something that weird and miraculous. Another time, um, and, and by the way, I, I wish I had time to full, I could do like a seven-week series on Samson. He is a very interesting guy. One of his issues was he was a loner. And we know we're better together. Right. And so he was a loner and just it seemed, he was the, I think maybe the only judge, I'm not positive, but one of very few judges during this time period that did not lead anyone. I believe he had, a, had an anointing as a leader, but he, he didn't lead others. And so there was a time when his own people, the Israelites, said, what are you always picking on the Philistines for? Like, we feel like you're making more trouble for us. So they tied him up with new ropes, with two new ropes, and they handed him over to the Phil Philistines. They, they just said, here you go. Here, we're giving you Samson. We know he's been troubling you. We don't want him to stir up trouble for us. They give him to him. Judges 15, 14 to 15 is what it says. As they, as they took Samson, as Samson arrived at the city of Lehi, the, the Philistines came shouting in triumph, wow, he's tied up, he's being handed to us, yay, woo! But the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson, and he snapped the ropes on his arms as if they were burnt strands of flax, a grain, and they fell from his wrist. So he was all tied up, with new ropes, You're like you just cannot snap those. But God's spirit came on him powerfully, and he snapped them as if they were burnt through, as if they were burnt ropes, as if they were ash. How easy would that be to snap if they were ash? That's how easy he did it. But notice this. Samson may not have been a huge brute. And I wonder if sometimes we're kind of giving his muscles the credit because the reason he snapped those ropes is because the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. Right. Maybe he was built like me, and it was impossible for him to break those ropes, yet he did. Yeah. And God, the Spirit of God did it. Yeah. So the Spirit of the Lord was his source of his strength, not right. his muscles and not his uncut hair. His uncut hair spoke of his consecration, but his strength was the Lord. Verse 15, then, as if that's not enough, he freed himself. He found the jawbone of a recently killed donkey. It must have been laying there on the ground or something. He picked it up, and he killed a thousand Philistines with it. Okay, one man, no modern weapons, just a bone. And he kills a thousand Philistines with it. That is miraculous. Yeah. The spirit of the Lord came upon him. On another occasion, he picked up the city gates. Like picture the old walled cities. He picked, picked up the city gates, posts, bar, and all, and just walked off with them. Wow, that's miraculous. God's power came upon him, and he was able to do these things. 
And, and really, we, we see throughout his life, no Philistine could defeat Samson. I mean, he was walking in his anointing to defeat the Philistines. And they, they just couldn't, they couldn't defeat him. There's nothing they could do. And I believe God was trying to show his people that God's power and victory come when you live a consecrated life. And that's a lesson we can apply today. God's power, God's victory come when you live a consecrated life. Consecrated means devoted to God, dedicated to God, set apart for God. That's when God's power, his victory, spiritual victory comes to you. Now, I believe that Samson's life could have sparked a national revival because the Holy Spirit was coming upon him, and he, he just did not do that in those days, but he came upon him. And if, if Samson had really understood this one truth, I believe God could have started a spiritual revival, not just a freedom from oppression. If he would have understood this one thing, and this is the bottom line of this message, spiritual victory flows from consecration to God. Spiritual victory flows from consecration to God. And spiritual defeat follows flirtation with sin. Spiritual victory flows from consecration to God. When you are devoted to God, when you are focused on God, when you are sacrificing to God, when you are giving yourself to God, spiritual victory flows from that. But on the flip side, spiritual defeat in your life follows flirtation with sin. Now, Samson was consecrated to God up to a point. Before he was born, the angel of the Lord says to his mother, his hair must never be cut, and he obeyed that. And obedience is a part of consecration. So he, at least in that, was consecrated to God. He obeyed that commandment. And also, he stepped out in his calling, which was to begin to deliver Israel from the oppression of the Philistines. Okay, so he's obeying, he's, he's stepping out in his calling. So he is consecrated to the Lord up to a point. But it's easy to confuse giftedness with godliness. And sometimes because we're operating in our giftedness, we assume we're godly. We must be approved by God. I must be really like God because I am operating in the gifts God gave me. But just because you're gifted doesn't mean you're godly. God may be using you, but God may not be pleased with your lifestyle. Spiritual victory flows from consecration to God. Spiritual defeat flows follows flirtation with sin. And unfortunately, I'm sorry to break this news to you, Samson continually flirted with sin. He fell in love at first sight with a Philistine girl. And the Bible says that, that he saw her and he went home and he told his parents, I'm in love with this girl Arrange a marriage for me. I mean, no please, no nothing. I don't know. Maybe in that day, that's how you do it. I don't know. But he said, I'm in love with her. Arrange a marriage. Now, his godly parents tried to talk him out of it. And you know what? They were right. His godly parents said, can't you find someone from, from the Israelite nation, from, from the people who worship the one true God? Can't you find a girl from there? And Samson was adamant, I saw her, she looks good, I want her, arrange a marriage. Now the Bible tells us behind the scenes, God said, okay, I'm going to work with this. And I'm going to use this to begin to, uh, to uh, uh, my next steps of judgment against the, the Philistines. So God, God, God redeemed it, I mean, he, he's going to use it. Um, but it, it was not God's best for him. And so in, the, in this whole situation of this love at first sight thing. I, I don't have time for the whole story, unfortunately. I, that's why all of these judges, I just want to tell you the whole story. I hope you'll read it on your own. But in this, Samson lost his bride. In the end, he was not able to marry her. And he ended up, though, taking revenge because of that and killing many Philistines. It's a whole long story, but God, God's working his judgment, even though Samson was making a, 
a really a wrong choice. He was flirting with sin. Uh, 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 the, the rest of the story is pretty graphic, so it appears like he was not impure with her. He just saw her. She was not in the eligible group, but he wanted her anyway. So he's flirting with sin. Well, then the next uh, encounter we see with Samson and the opposite sex is that the Bible says he saw a Philistine prostitute. So he said the, that other girl, she looks good to me. I want to marry her. And then he saw a prostitute, a Philistine prostitute, and he went in to be with her. So now he's gone a little further. He's no longer flirting with sin. Not only was this act immoral, and it was in direct rebellion to God's command, which said, do not intermarry with the people of the land. Like, he couldn't even redeem this by saying, well, I'll marry her. That was still in rebellion to God's command for the Israelites. Not only was it immoral, rebellious, but he was flirting with sin and flirting with the enemy. So he had come to push back the Philistines, and now he's going in and being intimate with them. And then finally, I'm just fast forwarding ahead a little bit. Samson fell in love with the infamous Delilah. Delilah. Samson and Delilah. The, and she was a Philistine. The Philistine rulers secretly went to her and, and they offered to each give her 1,100 pieces of silver. So the estimate is five rulers, 5,500 pieces of silver, so a big price. If she would go and entice Samson to tell, to tell her and to tell them the secret of his strength so that they could capture him. So it's kind of an interesting story. Now, I don't know if Samson moved into her house, but he, we see from the story he frequently stayed the night there. All right, this is with a Philistine woman. Delilah pressed him, tell me the secret of your strength. She's pressing him over and over again. So he says, well, if I were tied up with seven un, undried, so uh, new bowstrings, I'll become weak. So Delilah ties him up like that. And she calls to some Philistines who were hiding in another part of her house. And she gives the signal by, calling to, by saying this to Samson, Samson, get up! The Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson snaps off those seven undried bowstrings, so very, very taut, impossible to break. He breaks them off as if it's nothing. And immediately, Delilah says, what are you doing with me? I thought you loved me. Why don't you tell me? She starts pleading with him again to tell her his secret. And then he, she's begging, begging, begging. So he says, well, if I were tied up with brand new ropes, I'll become weak. Spoiler alert, remember, he already was. The Israelites tied him up with two brand new ropes. That did not make him weak. But he tells her, well, if you tie me up with new ropes, brand new ropes, I'll become weak. So Delilah ties him up. Then she calls out, to the, uh, the, giving the signal to the guys hiding in the house, hey, Samson, the Philistines are here. They're going to capture you. Wake up. He snaps off those ropes, and no one captures him. Delilah is super mad. And she begins to beg him, and she pleads, and she tries the good cop, bad cop, and she, she's trying everything she knows, every trick in her book to get him to tell her the secret of his strength. And so he says, well, if my hair were woven into the fabric in your loom and cinched down, I'd become weak. So in her house, there, there must have been a loom there where you would weave rugs or weave fabric. And she was, she was in the middle of a project. And Samson said, well, if you weave my hair into that, then, uh, then I'll become weak and uh, I, 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 I can't fight. Same thing as before. She does. She weaves his hair in that loom. And then she calls out, Samson, the Philistines are here to attack you. And he shakes it off. Like there's just no way that you or, you or I could do that. It, 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 he shakes it off, the power of God, uh, and he's free once again. So I don't know about you, if you've been, uh, if you're familiar with the story and you've read it before, I have read it many, many times, and I have always wondered, what is going on here? Why would Samson tell her these things? 
And there is a theory, and oh, wow, this is a very, very intriguing theory to me. It, it appears that these are bedroom conversations. So they're alone, and Delilah's like, may, baby, how can I make you weak? And he goes, tie me up. Have you noticed that all three things, all three lies he told her were about being bound? He could have just simply said, well, if I wear the sandals of a Gentile, I'll be weak. Or if I drink the, the, the goat's milk, then I'll be weak. I mean, he could have just made up anything, but he didn't. He made up three things about bondage. Now, Delilah is somehow able to tie him up, so she's with him. He's not fighting back doesn't seem to be resisting, she ties him up. I don't know if this theory is true, but it does kind of be like, oh, well, that would fill in some gaps in the, in the story if that's what's going on, if he's just perversely enjoying himself. So tie me up, baby. But finally, after those three times, Delilah torments Samson until he told her the truth. And the, the story's in Judges chapter 16, Verses 19 to 20, Delilah lulled Samson to sleep with his head in her lap, and then she called in a man to shave off the seven locks of his hair. Samson had told her, the secret of my strength is I've never cut my hair. I've been a Nazarite since birth, and if my hair were gone, my strength would be gone. So she calls a barber in lulls him to sleep, and he begins to cut the hair. In this way, she began to bring him down, and his strength left him. Then she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you, just like she did three times before. And when he woke up, he thought, I'll do like I always do, and I'll shake myself free. But listen to this next chilling phrase. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. That is possibly one of the most chilling sentences in the Bible. He didn't realize the Lord had left him. Remember, his hair was not the secret. That is not the source of his strength. The spirit of the Lord is the source of his strength. And when God saw this compromise on many levels of compromise, God said, okay, I'm going to withdraw I'm going to withdraw my spirit and my power from you. This time, the Philistines came in from that other room in the house. They captured him. They gouged out his eyes, and they took him off to prison to grind grain. And it's ironic. The first and only physical injury that we're aware of that the Philistines were able to, to uh, inflict on Samson was on his eyes. They went right for the source of his weakness, his vulnerable spot. And that's where the enemy came in and took him down. Spiritual victory flows from consecration to God. And spiritual defeat follows flirtation with sin. So in Samson's case, his flirtation with sin, and we see it through his whole life, cost him his consecration to God. And that's the issue. And when he lost his consecration, he lost his power, and he was defeated. No consecration, no spiritual victory. Now he was blinded, bound, and going around in circles. He had plenty of time to repent, though, there in the jail, there in the prison. He's just grinding grain day in and day out. And as he was doing this, as time went on, his hair began to grow back. And I believe he remembered his consecration to the Lord. Uh, I've been uh, trying my, you know, my hand at a beard. Yeah. And I can tell you, I'm very aware of it. I'm very aware of it. <laughs> It's scratchy, you know, it's, it's there all the time. It's there. And I would imagine that Samson, he's blinded, he, he's grinding out that grain, he's doing uh, uh, basically slave labor, a prisoner labor, and it begins to itch. And I don't know if he can even scratch it, but he's like, hey, my hair's growing back. I remember when I had hair, 
And when I did cut it because the Lord told me to be devoted to him. And I believe, I'm reading between the lines here, but I believe he repented and said, God, uh, I am sorry I left my consecration. I, I want to be consecrated to you. Well, the most interesting thing happened. Samson was summoned from that prison uh, to a huge gathering of Philistines at, a, at a, an idol temple, the temple of their false god, Dagon. And Samson stood between the two main central pillars in the temple. And I, I actually have a picture of probably not that temple, but this is a smaller Philistine house temple that, is, that they have dug up. And notice those two central pillars. It was a part of their architecture. Uh, and so, like I say, uh, we, the, 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 the town where this temple was uh, now is buried beneath centuries of dust. But uh, that kind of gives me an idea, and those are about six feet apart, so a, a nice tall man, could he, could he could touch both pillars at the same time. And so Samson is there. There are uh, thousands of people gathered, and they're making fun of him. And they're celebrating, hey, Samson, the one who thought he could set our fields on fire now, we gouged his eyes out. We own him now. And his God must have been powerless to save him. And they're making fun of him. And they're like, Samson, do a little dance for us. And they're, they're mocking him. It's terrible, this great, mighty warrior of God. But Samson prayed that God would strengthen him one more time. You notice he didn't say, I'm going to be strong like I always am. I'm the fox catcher. I'm the gate snatcher. I'm going to just go ahead and move me some pillars. He didn't say that. He said, Spirit of God, come. Come into this situation. Come and give me strength. Come and give me power. And God gave him the miraculous power to push those wooden pillars off their stone bases. Now, those pillars were holding up the roof and people on the roof. So like they, they were not going to budge. But God gave them the power to push them down. The whole temple came crashing down, killing 3,000 Philistines and killing Samson. Spiritual victory flows from consecration to God. Spiritual defeat follows flirtation with sin. Now I want to bring it to us. Just like Samson most of us don't crash and burn in a second. We don't crash and burn in a minute. We flirt with sin first. There's a process. It's usually a slow, steady process. You flirt with sin, get away with it, it seems. Get in a little deeper, try a little bit more. It's called backsliding, sliding back away from God. And that's why Job said, it's written down in Job 31.1, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. You notice he didn't just say, I made a covenant not to commit adultery. What he said was, I made a covenant not to even look with lust. He, sa he said, I'm not even going to flirt with sin. In the New Testament, in Romans chapter 6, verses 12 to 13, it says, Do not, somebody say, do not. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument, a tool of evil to serve sin. Instead, here's the do, the opposite do. Do give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead spiritually, but now you have new life spiritually. So use your whole body, your whole self, as an instrument, a tool to do what is right for the glory of God. So Paul is saying, the, who wrote the Romans, we have a responsibility here. We have a, you and I have a responsibility to, to refuse to do some things and to do some other things, to refuse to let sin control you, to refuse to be just a tool of evil. And we have the opposite duty to give yourself completely to God, to consecrate yourself to God, to be like a Nazarite all the time, consecrated to God, separated from other things that would lead you away from God. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what's right for the glory of God. Here's the trouble. You can't do it. I can't either. 
No one can. If we could live a sinless life on our own, we would not have, need, have needed Jesus or his sacrifice. You or I, in our own strength, cannot keep this command. We can't do it. It is a command, and it is a command for your good. It's a command to help you avoid ruin in your life. It's a command to help you experience spiritual victory in your life. It's a command for your good, but you can't. You can't. No, no one can on your own. We need Jesus. He is the one who did do it. He was tempted in every way like we were, yet without sin. He never sinned. And he showed us by his lifestyle how to not flirt with sin. And it's just simply this. Completely rely on the Spirit of God. Completely rely on the Spirit of God. That's what Jesus did. He said, uh, and we read it recently in our, in our Bible reading plan. I just do what the Father, my, our Heavenly Father does. That's what I do, Jesus said. I do what the Heavenly Father does. He showed us that's what you got to do, but we cannot do it on our own. It's interesting. There's a lot of similarities between Samson and Jesus. There's a weird word. I don't really like this word, but you will see it if you read much theological uh, literature. Samson was a type of Christ. It means he was a picture a, there's something about his life that pointed to Jesus. And there, there's a list of like 20 things, but I just noticed this. An angel foretold both of their births. An angel foretold Samson's birth, foretold Jesus' birth. They were bor both born to deliver their people from their enemies. Jesus from the, uh, deliver us from the enemy, Satan. Both were betrayed by close friends for the price of silver. Both died with their arms stretched out. Jesus, arms stretched out on the cross. Samson, arms stretched between two pillars. Here's kind of interesting. But Samson bowed to sin, and Jesus did it. And Jesus didn't just come to rescue you from enemies out there, flesh and blood enemies. He came to rescue you and me from sin. So when you put your faith in Jesus, he empowers you to live a holy life. So would you stand? We want to stand and, and just pray in response to this. Online, you might feel weird to stand, but if you can, if, if at all possible, I encourage you to stand also because we're in this together. We're worshiping together. We're responding together. Let's stand. Let's, let's say, okay, this moment is different than the moment I just lived. Uh, this is a response moment. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray? Lord, first of all, I pray that you would help us to learn from Samson's mistakes. He continually flirted. He saw how close he could live to sin, and he thought he could get away from it. But your word is true. The wages, the penalty of sin is death, and it ultimately led to death for him. Lord, we know that sin in our life leads to death. If we sin today, we may not physically die of a heart attack immediately that moment but something dies in us. Sin leads to the death that is divorce, death of a marriage. Sin leads to death of relationships. Sin leads to death of the cells in our body when we sin against our body. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to choose you and choose life. Lord, help us to not die. Lord, I pray that you would call us to consecration, that you would forgive us for flirting with sin. And we live in a, in a day and age when sin is pushed at us so hard, 24-7 from every direction. Lord, I pray that you would help us to make a covenant with our eyes, not to look with lust. But Lord, there are other kinds of sin. Lord, I pray that you would help us to not uh, flirt with sin with our time card at work. We've known people who have done that. Help us to not sin by flirting, flirt with sin on our taxes. Help us not to flirt with sin in any way, but instead help us to live consecrated, devoted to you, Lord. Would you keep your heads bowed for just a moment? I just want to just let you have a very personal response. I want to ask you, have you been flirting with sin? Maybe it's lust, maybe it's something else. 
Maybe you've relaxed your standards. Maybe you've made excuses. Maybe, maybe you've looked over your shoulder and said, well, it doesn't seem to be getting me in any trouble. Maybe you've said to yourself, well, I'll just ask forgiveness later. Maybe you've gotten in deeper and deeper and you're not sure how to get out. If any part of that applies to you, would you just look up at me and just catch my eye and I'm just gonna pray for you. And I love you, I care about you, and God loves you and cares about you even more. And I just want you to know that there's nothing secret from God. He already knew. But when, when you just looked at me, uh, many of you in this room, what you did is you took a step of faith and you did something and you said, Pastor, I'm just letting another person know I have flirted with sin. And God sees that and God is applauding that tiny step right now. That is the beginning of consecration or it can be if you go that way. So I'd like to just pray for every one of you. And online, I, I apologize, I cannot see you. I can, can't see you to look at me, but God sees you. And I just wanna pray for online and in the room right now, Lord, you see everyone who just looked up at, at me. And there's so many ways to flirt with sin. Lust is such a big, obvious one. And Samson, it was, he was just all about it and was very flagrant with it. But Lord, we know there are a lot of subtle ways we flirt with sin sin of pride, sin of finances, sin of lying, sin of, of cheating, sin of lust, all of that stuff. There are many ways that we flirt with sin. So Lord, right now, we bring that to you. We bring that flirtation to you right now. We lay it at the feet of Jesus right now, and we surrender it to you, Lord God. We don't want it anymore. We don't want to live that way. We need you, and Lord, there is no way we can live a holy life on our own. There is no way, zero chance. But with the Spirit of God, even a skinny guy could lift up city gates. And with the Spirit of God, we can turn away from sin. With the Spirit of God, we can consecrate ourselves to you, Lord. And so in these moments, I pray you would help us to take a vow. I know that's very serious before you. That a vow of coming close to you, a vow of devotion to you, a vow of consecration to you, Lord. And Lord, we just bring our lives to you. We lay our whole lives on the altar of sacrifice to you. Spiritually speaking, we bring ourselves to you. We give you ourselves and we ask you, Lord, help us be consecrated, devoted, committed to you. Help us to be separated from other things. One of the things a Nazarite was separated from was death. Lord, help us to be separated from things that kill. Kill the body or the spirit. Help us to be separated from that. Help us to be consecrated to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And you can look up at me just for a moment. I, I just want to offer this to you. You are never going to be pure without the Spirit of God. So that's where, that's, that's the most important thing we can do is just go to the Spirit of God. You can never stop flirting with financial sin without the Spirit of God because it's just too tempting. There's just too much opportunity out there. So we began by saying, Lord, I consecrate myself to you. But we can support each other along the way. And I don't know if you are all aware, but we have a, a, an accountability group. It is based on accountability software, accountable to you, the number two, you. And it is a, a hope and life group. And several of us belong to it. It is just a way that we can support each other. It's a software you, uh, uh, you install on your computer or, and other devices. I've got it on all my devices as well. And if you ever start to, to just flirt that way, the accountability partner that you have chosen will get a text or an email right then. And, and we can just call and say, hey, how, how are you doing? What's going on right now? How can I pray for you? And it is so helpful. It is a preventative medicine. Trust me. I know that that is there and that helps. And I, 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 every time I bring up this topic, I, I just want you to know, and I am a co-struggler. But I'm not, I, I believe God loves me too much to leave me there. So I'm not settling for that life. I'm settling for a life of consecration. 
and I'm putting boundaries in place to help me with the other because it's practical. If you would like to be a part of that group, let me know some way. There's a million ways to communicate with me. Just let me know. You can choose your own accountability partner. So I would sign you up into the group and I will never know another thing that happens on your computer or devices unless you ask me to be your accountability partner, which I do do that for some of our, our people and for others, they have their own. So either way, I just want to offer this resource to you. Text me, uh, private message me on Facebook, go to our website and click on contact us and just say, I need to get a message to Pastor Garrett. Talk to me, write me a note and put it in my hand, do something. But let's do this together. And that is not gonna solve the problem of flirtation with sin, but it is going to help. All right, men and women, you're invited to that group. Okay, one last thing. Would you bow your heads one more time? I just wanna give you an, uh, an invitation to put your faith in Jesus. We've been talking about how you cannot save yourself. You need a savior because we are all sinners who need a savior. I wanna invite you to put your faith in Jesus to save you, not in your good works, not in what you can do, not in your trying harder, but in Jesus, in his sacrifice. How do you do that? Turn away from your sin, turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead. If you wanna do that today, in the room or online, would you raise your hand? Online, raise your hand to God. In the room, just raise your hand to say, Pastor, I'm making a decision today to become a Christian, to put my faith in Jesus, and I'll pray for you. Awesome. I'm going to pray for you right now. Lord, I just pray that every single person who is hearing this message would put their faith in you, Jesus. Help us to turn away from our sin. Help us to turn away even from flirting with sin. Help us to give our whole life over to you, Jesus. And Lord, we ask you right now to lead Lord, we want to be your apprentices. We don't want to just be a Christian in mentality. We want to be a, a, an apprentice, a disciple who follows you and lives your way. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you made that decision to put your faith in Jesus today, let me know. Fill out a Connect card. We're giving you a resource online. How to do that in the room. You know where the Connect cards are. Check the box at the bottom and give me enough contact info so I know you made that decision. And we will cheer you on. God bless you. Amen. 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 God's power and victory come when you consecrate yourself to the Lord. So good. So good. Well, so at this time, the ushers are going to be coming down the aisles to collect your Connect cards. If you haven't filled it out, now is the really fast time. You have about 2.5 seconds to do so. Um, we will see you next week. Remember, next week is our um, all church. No, wait, it's not next week. That's, that's in like a month. Never mind. Well, remember, in a month from now is the all church barbecue <laughs> to bring your friends. All right, we love you. God bless. Have a good day.